Hello brothers and sisters, it's the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions and Publishing and I want to welcome you guys and invite you to go and check out our new Kingdom Documentaries channel. The link is in the description, so go check out our new channel. It's called Kingdom Documentaries, and you can find the link that'll take you straight to it in the description. Grace, peace, and God bless. Hello brothers and sisters and welcome to part one of our documentary Unholy Alliance. The secret history of the Hashishin Order and the Knights Templar is shrouded in mystery and legend. Both orders were allies at times and enemies at others. Part one is a summary of the Hashishin and their history. Welcome to 1090 AD in Alamut, Iran, a stronghold perched in the Alborz Mountains. This strategic fortress would become the nerve center for one of history's most enigmatic and feared groups. At a time when the Islamic world was divided into various caliphates and sultanates, the stage was set for someone extraordinary to take advantage of the chaos. Enter Hassani Saba, a man whose name would soon resonate with dread and awe across the Islamic world. A master strategist and theologian, Saba had both the intellect and ambition to seize this fortress and the fractured Islamic world's attention. In a society rife with religious and political tension, he was a force to be reckoned with. Saba's formation was shaped by his extensive travels. He journeyed to Egypt, absorbing Ismaili Shia teachings and political ideologies. These experiences would not only fortify his religious convictions, but also expose him to methodologies of secrecy, subterfuge, and espionage, crucial skills for his later missions. How did Hassan Isava capture this fortress, once considered unassailable? Through a brilliant blend of cunning, covert ops, and a dash of charisma, he managed to infiltrate Alamut, sway its occupants, and seize control without shedding much blood. This feat alone showcased his strategic genius. With Alamut in his hands, Hassan Isaba founded the Hashashin, or as we now call them, the Assassins. Contrary to popular belief, these were not just stealthy killers, but a nuanced organization with theological foundations. Alamut became a haven for Saba's loyalists, a base for his operations, and a school for the deadly arts of assassination and deception. This eagle's nest was not just a pile of stones. It was the heart of a network that would soon send shivers down the spines of emperors, caliphs, and kings alike. As Hassan Saba secured Alamut, he realized that his vision needed more than just a fortress. It needed foot soldiers. To bring his grand plans to fruition, Saba needed fiercely loyal men willing to lay down their lives for the cause. The next decade from 1090 to 1100 AD would see a wave of intense recruitment. So who were these recruits? Known as Fidai, these were not just any young men. Chosen carefully for their loyalty, intellect, and potential for ruthlessness. The term Fidai means those who sacrifice themselves. They lived up to that name, becoming the hands and feet of the Hashashin. What did their training involve? It was a rigorous program that combined theology, philosophy, and the martial arts. They learned the art of subterfuge, blending into crowds and striking with deadly precision. 
In essence, they were trained to be scholars, spies, and assassins all rolled into one. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Fidei training was their instruction in disguises and role-playing. They were taught to assume multiple identities, allowing them to infiltrate enemy territories or mingle in public spaces unnoticed. This ability to be a chameleon made them terrifyingly effective agents. Finally, the Fidei were not just physical assassins. They were masters of psychological warfare. Trained to execute their missions in the most public of spaces, they aimed to strike fear into the hearts of their targets and their followers alike. This wasn't just about killing. It was about sending a message that echoed through the corridors of power. By 1100 AD, Hassanai Saba's Hashashin were ready to unveil their true purpose, a campaign of political assassinations. It's essential to understand that they operated in a time when caliphs, sultans, and warlords often played deadly games of power. Into this cauldron of instability, the Hashashin threw their own uniquely chilling brand of terror. Rulers, generals, and scholars, anyone who posed a threat to their religious and political objectives, was fair game. But they didn't just kill. They turned assassination into a spectacle, executing their strikes in public places for maximum psychological impact. Fear was their most potent weapon. Unlike other warriors of their time, they didn't seek battlefield glory. Their stage was the market square, the mosque, or the royal court. By carrying out assassinations in broad daylight, they amplified the psychological impact, creating an atmosphere of pervasive dread among their enemies. One stark fact that set them apart was their absolute commitment to their cause, even if it meant losing their own lives. It was this level of mercilessness and fearlessness that made them so effective and terrifying. Their willingness to die made it nearly impossible to deter them. Their campaign from 1100 to 1124 AD had a twofold effect. First, they did manage to eliminate several high-profile figures, shaping the political landscape of the Islamic world. Second, their reputation for mercilessness became a form of social capital, a currency of fear that would be spent wisely in the years to come. The 13th century sees the Islamic world rocked by seismic shifts. While the Hashashin have built a fortress of influence, Alamut finds itself increasingly isolated. They are surrounded by larger powers, including the rising Mongol Empire, an unstoppable force reshaping the geopolitics of the era. The Mongol Empire, originating from the Central Asian steppes, is an entity unlike anything the Islamic world has encountered before. Led by the descendants of Genghis Khan, they have swiftly carved out one of the largest empires in history, toppling civilizations from China to Russia. Now they turn their eyes to the Islamic heartlands. Their military prowess is legendary, boasting rapid cavalry and devastating siege techniques. As they invade Muslim territories, capturing cities like Baghdad, and effectively ending the Islamic Golden Age, their collision course with the Hashashin becomes inevitable. The Mongols, who follow a code of laws known as the Yasa, view the Hashashin's covert killings as not just politically inconvenient, but morally abhorrent. These two radically different philosophies are destined to clash. As the Mongol Empire expands, its leaders begin to view the Hashashin not just as a local nuisance, but as a significant obstacle. The Hashashin, once the shadow brokers of power, are now seen as targets. The strategic tide has turned. It's no longer a game they control. Enter Hulagu Khan, the Mongol commander tasked with the siege of Alamut. He's armed not just with a massive army, but also with powerful siege equipment, setting his eyes firmly on the prize. Alamut. This is a monumental moment, signaling a seismic change in power dynamics. The walls of Alamut, once thought to be impregnable, are bombarded day and night by Mongol siege engines. The ground shakes as massive stones hurled from catapults demolish the fortifications. Archers fire volleys, setting parts of the castle ablaze. Imagine the desperation among the Hashashin. Their fortress, their sanctuary is being torn apart before their very eyes. Inside Alamut, the situation grows dire. Supplies are running low. 
warriors clutched their scimitars with hands trembling from hunger and exhaustion. Yet, the commanding shouts of their leaders echo through the stone halls, urging them to hold the line to protect their sacred home. The Hashashin resort to desperate measures, hurling projectiles and hot oil upon the encroaching Mongols, trying to repel them one last time. As Mongol war drums reverberate through the mountains, their infantry makes a final push. They employ scaling ladders and siege towers to breach the weakened walls. The Hashashin put up a last fierce resistance, but it's futile. When the dust settles, Alamut falls, captured, looted, and destroyed. 1256 AD marks the official end of Hashashin's rule from Alamut. In one sweeping motion, the Mongols dismantle what took decades to build. The Hashashin's reign is snuffed out, turning the page to a new chapter in Middle Eastern history, where they no longer hold the pen. It's important to recognize the indelible impact the Hashashin had on history and culture. This sect, operating from the lofty heights of Alamut, laid the foundation for modern covert operations and warfare their legacy extends beyond history books and academic studies. The archetype of the stealthy, resourceful killer owes much to Asani Sapa's original assassins. The First Crusade, one of the most unlikely success stories in history. A motley army of warrior pilgrims traveled thousands of miles from Western Europe to the Holy Land, where they battled some of the most formidable Eastern powers of the period, such as the Seljuk Turks and the Fatimid Caliphate. Amazingly, the Crusaders won and carved out a few tiny states in the Eastern Levant. But then, most of the Crusaders went home. Left behind were the few knights, adventurers, priests, and pilgrims intent on fighting for survival in these distant lands. It was an age of warrior kings, of battles to the death against impossible odds. The Kingdom of Jerusalem, led by Baldwin I, and the Principality of Antioch, led by the Norman Tancred, were only beginning to take shape. How did the remaining pilgrims survive? How did the newly emerging Crusader states endure in the very heart of the Muslim world? How did the neighboring Muslim rulers and peoples react to the presence of these new Christian kingdoms? Today, we'll follow the exhilarating early history of the Crusader states and answer the question, what happened after the First Crusade? The First Crusade proved to be one of the most momentous events in history. After some four centuries of Muslim rule, Jerusalem, Antioch, and other cities and regions in the Eastern Levant were once again held by Christian powers. But after the final success of the First Crusade, the Battle of Ashkelon, the bulk of the Crusader army returned home to the Latin West. Left behind were small Christian forces, holding a few scattered outposts deep in the heart of Muslim territory. Piety and fighting spirit had led to these first victories, but it would take more than that for the fledgling Crusader states to survive. Fortunately for the Crusaders, the men who remained to rule were quite capable. The Kingdom of Jerusalem was in the hands of Godfrey of Bouillon, a pious, tough warrior well-liked by his contemporaries. Godfrey was a soldier's soldier, but also an approachable ruler who inspired loyalty in his followers. He was austere in his tastes, shunning fine clothes, like many of the knights from his ancestral region, he didn't adopt the new clean-shaven, short-haired style of the Normans, but wore his blonde hair and beard long like Charlemagne. By now, his long hair and beard were likely growing whiter as he approached his early forties, though he was still strong and vigorous. In the aftermath of the First Crusade, Godfrey was most often found in his saddle, alongside his knights, personally commanding the campaigns to secure the newly conquered kingdom. 
We're used to seeing neat, colorful maps displaying the Crusader states, but defined borders didn't exist at the close of 1099. The Kingdom of Jerusalem contained Jerusalem itself, Bethlehem, northward to the plain of Jezreel, and Nablus, protected by the Jordan Valley to the east. To the north, the kingdom included Galilee and Nazareth, Haifa, and toward the south, Hebron, and the little castle of St. Abraham. To the west, the kingdom included Ramla and Leda, and finally its port of Jaffa. Many Palestinian cities, including most of the wealthy coastal towns, remained in Muslim hands. Farther north in Syria, the Principality of Antioch was ruled by Bohemond and his South Italian Normans. Bohemond, like Godfrey, was a competent ruler, but shrewder and more daring. He was a giant of a man, at his best facing down impossible odds. Princess Anna Komnena, daughter of the Byzantine Emperor Alexius Komnenos, was a teenager when she first saw Bowman as her father negotiated with him at Constantinople during the First Crusade. In her writings, Anna describes Bowman vividly. She seems to have been rather taken with this handsome, roguish stranger, though she was clearly afraid of him as well. Bowman had gained control of the ancient Byzantine city of Antioch in 1098 during the most perilous phase of the First Crusade. And from there, he began to expand his power base into a formidable northern Syrian state. Bohemond's principality contained two parts, Cilicia and northern Syria, as Ralph Udale puts it, almost at right angles to each other. And their angle formed by their shores was the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea. Cilicia's Armenian population was quite friendly to the Crusaders, especially as they wanted to avoid falling again under the power of the Byzantine Emperor. Here, the Principality contained the prosperous cities of Tarsus, Mamistra, Adana, and Amzarba. After the main army of the First Crusade moved on toward Jerusalem in 1098, Bohemond took Arta and the port of St. Simeon. Bohemond had attempted to take the Byzantine port of Latakia, but Raymond of Toulouse and other Crusaders loyal to the Emperor Alexius prevented him from achieving his aim. To the northeast of Antioch lay the county of Edessa, ruled by Godfrey of Bouillon's younger brother, Baldwin of Bologna. Count Baldwin held Edessa itself, as well as Turbacel, and the fortresses of Bira and Saruj. Here, too, the final shape of the state was only beginning to form. But here, too, Edessa had a gifted ruler. Taller and darker haired than his brother, Baldwin was a stern, less approachable man. Also, unlike his brother, he liked fine apparel. The chronicler, William of Tyre, says that he always wore a richly made mantle hanging from his shoulders. Though he was not as popular as his brother, Baldwin was a good commander, shrewd and far-sighted. He could anticipate problems and knew how to manage affairs and people. Early on during the First Crusade, he showed some rashness and self-seeking that almost caused mutiny in his men at one point. But by 1100, he was demonstrating increasing maturity and prudence. As a younger son, he was destined originally for the church and had received a clerical education. He knew church law well and could debate the finer points with any bishop. In the autumn of 1099, Baldwin of Bologna received correspondence from Bohemond at Antioch. Bohemond suggested that together the two of them should march with their forces as pilgrims to Jerusalem, where they could fulfill their vows to venerate the Holy Sepulchre of Christ. Baldwin agreed, and in November joined Bowman at the head of a considerable combined force. Baldwin and Bowman made it to Jerusalem after a long, difficult journey. Here, they celebrated Christmas with Godfrey of Bouillon. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the papal legate, Archbishop Dambert of Pisa, was elected Patriarch of Jerusalem. Godfrey and Bowman both did homage before Dambert, proclaiming themselves vassals of the Church as represented by the Pope's legate. For Bowman, this helped secure his legitimacy as Antioch's ruler. Prior to the First Crusade, Bowman and most of the other leaders of the Crusade had sworn before Alexius Comnenus to return any cities previously belonging to the Byzantines to the Emperor after they were conquered by the Crusaders, provided the Emperor continued to provide assistance and support throughout the Crusade. However, during the dark days of the Siege of Antioch, the Emperor had abandoned the Crusaders. Bowman devised a scheme to capture the city, on condition that he be allowed to keep it. The Crusaders had agreed at the time, though with some reluctance given their initial oath to Alexius. 
Bowman argued that Alexius had broken his part of the agreement, and so they were no longer obligated to return Antioch to him. Even today, it is difficult to refute Bowman's reasoning. Had Alexius not abandoned the Crusaders in their hour of need, there's little reason to doubt they would have returned Antioch to him. Now, receiving official recognition from the Pope's man, Bowman was far more confident in his position as Prince of Antioch. Godfrey tended to exhibit a simple, straightforward piety, and this may have inclined him toward accepting the overlordship of the church in Jerusalem. But he was also in a difficult situation. He had few men and funds, and Daimbert brought with him soldiers and wealth needed to help secure the new kingdom. Initially, the church seems to have envisioned the kingdom of Jerusalem as an ecclesiastical state, with a warrior prince like Godfrey acting as a subordinate military power to secure the rule of churchmen like Daimbert. But how long could this arrangement last? After Baldwin and Bowman completed their pilgrimage and returned home, Godfrey continued to campaign in Palestine. Many local Muslim rulers were eager to come to terms with him. In early 1100, Godfrey received embassies from the Muslim emirs of Ashkelon, Caesarea, and Acre. The ambassadors met with Godfrey while he was campaigning. He received them in his war tent. The Muslim officials were surprised to find not a regal prince sitting atop silken cushions, but a rather gruff, plainly dressed warrior. They found Godfrey sitting on the ground, wearing his armor, his sword lying next to him. He received their tributary payments and used the funds to help bolster the walls of Java. Jewish, Muslim, and Christian merchants operated freely across Palestine, and the prosperity benefited Godfrey, as well as the Fatimids of Egypt and the Turkish Emir of Damascus. Godfrey also financed improved fortifications for Tiberius, held by the Norman Tancred, nephew of Bowman. Tancred proved to be one of Godfrey's most energetic vassals, subduing the territory of Galilee. Together, Godfrey and Tancred conducted joint raids in the neighborhood of Damascus. Tancred, the son of Prince Bowman's sister, Emma, would be one of the most important figures in the early history of the Crusader states. He was a teenager during the First Crusade, but already Bowman's most trusted lieutenant. Like his uncle, he was aggressive and daring, a fierce commander in the field. He was less charismatic than his uncle, but probably a better politician. After returning to Antioch, Bohemond spent the first half of the year 1100 campaigning in the east, conquering territory from the Emir of Aleppo. In May, he besieged Apamea, ravaging its fields. In response, Ridwan, the Emir of Aleppo, assembled his army and advanced from Athareb, intent on driving the Franks from Kella. However, Bowman's knights from Jezer, Zerdana, and Sarmine, all now held by the Crusaders, inflicted a crushing defeat on Ridwan, capturing 500 Aleppan troops. This victory allowed Bowman to capture Kathar Haleb, Hadir, and most of the territory west of Aleppo. The Norman giant was now positioned to capture Aleppo itself. Suddenly, messengers arrived from Gabriel, the Armenian governor of Melitene in Anatolia. Gabriel begged for Bowman's assistance, for Melitene was besieged by the Turkish emir Donishmend of Sirvis. Bowman at once assembled a force of a few hundred and hurried to the relief of his Armenian ally. Worried about delay, Bowman hadn't waited to assemble a large army. As he advanced on Melitene in July of 1100, he was attacked by Donishmend, whose larger forces overcame Bowman's knights. While the Normans were put to flight, Bowman himself was captured in the battle. The Norman managed to dispatch a lock of his hair to his ally, Count Baldwin of Edessa. Baldwin at once assembled an army. As the Edessan Franks approached Melitene, Danish men raised his siege and retreated. Baldwin pursued the Turks for three days, but to no avail. He turned back. Melitene was saved, but Bowman was in the hands of Danish Mend. By now, Bowman was famous among his enemies as he was among the Christians. Danish Mend gained great prestige by capturing the legendary Norman giant. He held him prisoner at the fortress of Nixandria. 
And Bowman's time in captivity became the stuff of legend, and one tradition states that the emir's daughter, the beautiful Princess Melaz, fell in love with the handsome Norman and became his lover. Given all the other lore surrounding Bowman, this is no surprise. At around the same time that summer in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, Godfrey of Bouillon received a Venetian embassy at Jaffa, where they discussed besieging the port city of Haifa. However, Godfrey fell seriously ill, retiring to his house in the city. The Duke was surrounded by his closest followers. Meanwhile, Tancred and the Patriarch Danebird joined the Venetians in besieging Haifa. Godfrey's condition worsened. He made his final confession, received the Eucharist, and at last died on July 18, 1100. Albert of Aachen emphasizes the varied ethnicities of the Christians gathered in Jerusalem at this time. Gauls, Italians, Syrians, Armenians, and Greeks, writing that they all mourned Godfrey's death. He even says that local Muslims mourned his passing as well. Godfrey was buried at the entrance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was still largely in ruins, but soon to undergo extensive renovations by the Crusaders. Danebert had likely been looking forward to Godfrey's death as an opportunity. As it turned out, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Godfrey's knights quickly occupied the Tower of David in Jerusalem, then dispatched urgent word to Edessa, requesting that Godfrey's brother, Baldwin of Bologna, travel to Jerusalem to take his brother's throne. Count Baldwin had just returned from his fruitless effort to rescue Bowman when the embassy arrived announcing his brother's death. Baldwin didn't hesitate. Baldwin of Bork became the new Count of Edessa. Baldwin and Bologna's journey to Jerusalem wouldn't be easy. It took about five weeks and moved through rugged and often hostile territory. He reached Antioch quickly, where he sent his wife and baggage by sea to the port of Jaffa. Now came the difficult part. He marched south on October 2nd. At Tripoli, he received supplies from the emir. Then he continued south, negotiating a difficult passage along the coast toward Beirut. At the Dog River, on October 25, he encountered a Muslim army sent by Dukat of Damascus, intent on halting his advance. As the first units of both armies encountered each other, there was some brief fighting on the treacherous crags. But Baldwin quickly drew back, worried that his army was about to suffer an ambush by a much larger force. He laid camp for the night, during which his men endured harassing attacks from all sides. Fulker of Chartres, who was traveling with Baldwin at the time, provides a vivid account that conveys the author's terror during the battle. We feigned boldness, but we feared death. It was difficult to retreat, but more difficult to advance. On all sides we were besieged by our enemies. On one side, those in boats on the sea. On the other, those from the cliffs relentlessly pressed upon us. That day, nothing went well. We had no rest, nor were our thirsty beasts even watered. Indeed, I wished very much that I were in Chartres, or Orléans, and so did others. All that night we languished outside our tents, keeping very watchful. At dawn, Baldwin decided that the situation was deteriorating and ordered a retreat. Picking up, the Crusaders tried to withdraw. This emboldened the Turkish army. In the Battle of the Dog River, the Crusaders snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. The Turkish troops perhaps became overconfident, and Baldwin was able to shatter their initiative with a decisive cavalry charge. This was an early example of Baldwin's competence as a field commander, especially when he found the right balance of caution and boldness. News of this Frankish victory spread and established Baldwin's shining reputation well before he even arrived at Jerusalem. By November 9, Baldwin arrived at the Holy City. He was greeted enthusiastically by the population who conducted him to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. At least one man wasn't happy at all at Baldwin's arrival. Patriarch Danebert hoped to rule Jerusalem as a sort of bishop-prince. 
Baldwin, who knew church law well, disagreed sharply with Damard's interpretation of his role and would not show the patriarch the deference of his late brother. It was Baldwin who would, from the start, insist upon a strong centralized monarchy and who would lay the groundwork for a military establishment tightly organized around the king. For a kingdom surrounded by enemies, requiring a constant ability to project power, Baldwin would prove to be the ideal architect. William of Tyre describes Baldwin as a man who loved work and disdained idleness. Within days of his arrival, Baldwin led a force of knights toward Ascalon, where he inflicted a defeat on the city's Fatiman horsemen. Next, he smoked out and destroyed some local robbers hiding in caves near Beit Gibran. Finally, he led a reconnaissance expedition south as far as Wadi Musa, some 50 miles south of the Dead Sea. At last, he returned to Jerusalem on December 21. On December 25th, in the Church of the Nativity, Damebert reluctantly crowned Baldwin as King of Jerusalem. Unlike Godfrey, Baldwin was perfectly comfortable accepting this title. Baldwin quickly worked to have Damebert removed from office entirely, replacing him with a bishop who understood his role as an ally of the king. From this point forward, Jerusalem's patriarchs would overwhelmingly operate in close alignment with royal policy. The church was a critical source of wealth, and Baldwin needed its cooperation to support his army. After his coronation, Baldwin I, King of Jerusalem, was faced with a difficult situation. He held a tiny kingdom surrounded by enemy territory, with little more than 300 foot soldiers and 300 knights at his disposal. This was an astonishingly small number of men, considering that many of the surrounding Muslim states could assemble armies numbering in the thousands. The Frankish priest and chronicler, Fulcair of Chartres, who accompanied Baldwin to Jerusalem and served as his chaplain, wrote that he could scarcely understand why the neighboring Arab, Persian, and Turkish powers didn't simply overwhelm the undermanned Crusader kingdom. His explanation? God's mercy, but also Baldwin I's wise leadership. Fulcair argued in favor of Baldwin's decision to, unlike his brother, accept the title of king. A king is not made king against the mandate of God, wrote Fulcair. For when he is chosen rightly, and according to God's will, he is sanctified and consecrated with a lawful blessing. Anyone who receives that kingly power takes upon himself the honorable duty of rendering justice. He desires to do good work who desires to rule, but if he does not rule justly, he is not a true king. Here, Fulcair articulates the prevailing view of Christian kingship in the medieval Latin West. A king must be consecrated like a bishop according to God's law, and he must uphold the good if he is to maintain legitimacy. But Baldwin had a contentious history with his most powerful vassal, the Norman Tancred, Prince of Galilee. Tense negotiations were initiated to convince Tancred to appear at court and acknowledge Baldwin as king. But the problem was solved by March of 1101, when the Normans of Antioch sent a message to Tancred, asking him to come and rule in place of his captive uncle. Tancred readily agreed, and departed Galilee to take up rule in Antioch. Though these two young, headstrong men never got along, they were the two crucial architects of the early Crusader states. Godfrey and Bowman were the legends, but Baldwin and Tancred settled in for the tough, long work of actually building up the military strength and institutional structures of the Frankish East. Meanwhile, Pope Pascal sent a legate to the new kingdom, the Cardinal Maurice, in response to an appeal from Dambert of Pisa, who felt that he had been wrongly deprived of his office by Baldwin. But King Baldwin was no easy opponent in matters theological. Baldwin's broad knowledge of church law, combined with his keen rhetorical skill, contributed greatly to Maurice's decision. He agreed with the king and declared Dambert guilty and deposed. Dambert threw himself on Baldwin's mercy, begging forgiveness. Baldwin refused to soften his stance until Dambert began talking money, according to Albert of Aachen, 300 Byzants, for the funding of the military. 
Baldwin spoke to Maurice, and together, they agreed Danebert could be reinstated, provided he maintained his commitment to support the military establishment of the kingdom. With Tancred gone, Baldwin's vassals were mostly made up of his brother's knights and the men who traveled with him from Edessa. Haifa had been secured at the end of 1100, but Baldwin wanted to subdue other nearby port cities. This would increase the security and prosperity of the kingdom, allowing pilgrims and merchants to come and go more safely. Full Care describes the beginning of the Kingdom of Jerusalem's enduring dependence upon travelers arriving from the western homelands of the Franks. He writes how when pilgrims and travelers arrived, we promptly and joyfully met them as if they were saints. From them each of us anxiously inquired concerning his homeland and his loved ones. The new arrivals told us all that they knew. When we heard good news, we rejoiced. When they told of misfortune, we were saddened. They came to Jerusalem. They visited the Holy of Holies, for which purpose they had come. Such arrivals in the spring of 1101 helped Baldwin achieve his first conquests. Fleets of Genoese and Pisans arrived at Jaffa and joined the king in besieging Arsuf. Albert of Aachen tells us that the Muslim defenders surrendered after three days, and the chronicler Ibn al-Athir agrees that the citizens were allowed to depart with their lives. Fulcare says that the king gave the Muslims safe conduct to Ashkelon. Next, Baldwin dispatched messengers to Caesarea, asking the emir to surrender. He refused. Baldwin besieged the port, pressing it from all sides. The Muslim garrison fought bravely, but Baldwin raised a siege tower that reached higher than the city walls, while the Pisans and Genoese attacked from the sea. Fierce fighting broke out on the walls between Baldwin's men and the emirs. The crusaders were victorious and rampaged through the city, putting it to sack. Ibn al-Athir records, They took Caesarea by the sword, killing its people, and plundering what was there. Fulcare writes, Very few of the male sex were left alive, but a great many of the women were spared because they could always be used to turn the handmills. When the Franks captured the women, they bought and sold them, the comely and the ugly, among themselves, and the men also. Baldwin wanted to encourage other strongholds to follow the example of Arsuf and thus avoid Caesarea's grisly fate. With Arsuf and Caesarea now controlled by Frankish garrisons, Baldwin had greatly enhanced the power of the kingdom. But once he was back in Jerusalem, word began to filter in that the Fatimids of Egypt were assembling forces for a major attack on the Crusaders. Baldwin began to prepare his knights and asked Dambert for a contribution from the church. Dambert at once announced that he would give 200 marks for the maintenance of troops. However, Baldwin was approached by one of Dambert's subordinates, the Chancellor of the Holy Sepulchre, Arnulf, who claimed that Dambert was concealing a much larger sum for his personal wealth. Baldwin was furious. Albert of Aachen describes a scene in which Baldwin bursts in on the patriarch Dambert, feasting and making merry, and sharply rebukes him for living in luxury while the Holy Sepulchre is threatened. Dambert replied that the king had no right to treat the church like a vassal, nor deprive it of its rightful splendor. Baldwin responded forcibly that he would rip out the gold from the altar of the Holy Sepulchre if it would help him defend Christ's tomb. Albert writes, Having been proved guilty of this enormous fraud and treachery by proper witnesses before the king, the patriarch was no longer able to make excuses for himself, and he fell silent. He was at once and without delay deprived of the power and presentation of the Lord's sepulchre. Meanwhile, new reports confirmed that the Fatimids were indeed massing an enormous army in Egypt and preparing to invade the kingdom. It was September, and Baldwin was celebrating the feast of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary in Jerusalem. He at once put out the summons to the army and marched to Jaffa. There, the king strengthened the town's defenses and gathered around himself a force of some 300 knights and 900 infantry. Baldwin was about to face the first great challenge of his reign. 
the Fatimids, ruling one of the wealthiest and most powerful kingdoms in the Mediterranean world at that time, could assemble much larger forces. A Fatimid expeditionary force could number three to five thousand. At full strength, the Fatimids could field an army as large as twenty thousand, as they did at the Battle of Ashkelon during the First Crusade. The Fatimids recognized the weak position of the Crusaders. They meant to deal with this troublesome Frankish kingdom on their northern frontier once and for all. Although Fatimid Egypt was officially ruled by its caliph, it was the vizier Al-Afdal who exercised real power while the caliph lived in secluded luxury. Born in Acre to a family of Armenian Muslim converts, Al-Afdal was a capable ruler who expertly managed the intrigue-laden Fatimid court. Initially, he'd viewed the Crusaders as a useful tool in neutralizing the Seljuk Turks to the north. But once he realized that the Crusaders were determined to dominate Palestine, including the wealthy coastal ports, he resolved to destroy them. For his 1101 campaign, he gave command to the general, Said al-Dawla, and began assembling troops at Ashkelon in mid-July, according to the Muslim chronicler Ibn al kalanisi this was when rumors first reached the ears of King Baldwin, but the decisive confrontation wouldn't come until September. The size of al Dawla's army isn't certain. It numbered at the very least between three and five thousand, but it may have been as large as eleven thousand. Without question, it greatly outnumbered the small army cobbled together by Baldwin I. The Fatimid army was very different from the Turkish forces the Crusaders faced in Syria. Turkish armies were dominated by swift, light horse archers, making them highly mobile. Turkish forces also tended to be organized around tribal loyalties. The Fatimid army was funded by the wealthy coffers of Cairo and included plenty of mercenaries. At the core of the Fatimid army was its heavy cavalry, resembling the armored Byzantine horsemen of the day, and displaying the most loyalty to the Fatimid regime. Ethnically, these horsemen varied Arabs, Egyptians, Armenians, and more. Protected by mail, their primary weapons were the spear or sword. Light Berber cavalry were also loyal and key Fatimid units. The vizier hired light Turkish horse archers when he could, but never in large numbers, since Egypt lacked the pasture land to support Turkish ponies. Bedouin auxiliaries also served as light cavalry, though they could be unreliable, for they were just as likely to offer their services to the Crusaders, and might even turn on their Fatimid employers in the event of a defeat. It is a myth that the Fatimid heavy cavalry were less well-armed than their Frankish opponents. Steve Tibble points out that their arms and armor were fairly similar. The well-funded Fatimid regime itself manufactured an enormous assortment of weapons and armor in Cairo for its troops. Even Fatimid horses were often armored with mail or other protective equipment. The bulk of the Fatimid army was composed of infantry. Nubian and Sudanese units from sub-Saharan Africa, armed with enormous shields, cudgels, hammers, and spears, were deployed as a formidable infantry center. Many Sudanese served as the personal guard of the caliph, and were among the units most loyal to the Fatimid state. Syrians and Arabs also provided heavy or light infantry. There were large numbers of skilled infantry archers as well. As a whole, the Fatimid army was a well-funded, well-organized machine, but its reliance on mercenaries, coupled with the varying backgrounds of its troops, could lead to problems. If things went poorly on the battlefield, cohesion could collapse, and many troops preferred to flee rather than die for Cairo. In late August, the enormous Fatimid army marched steadily onto the plains near Ramla. Crusader scouts were tracking their movements. King Baldwin and his forces departed Jaffa on September 6 and advanced toward the enemy. The size of the Fatimid host with its immense baggage obliged it to move slowly. The most important units in Baldwin's army were the heavy Frankish cavalry. These were supported by more lightly armored mounted sergeants and squires and light local cavalry of eastern origin. 
The infantry made up the bulk of the army and was mostly composed of Eastern Christians, although some Franks were likely included in their ranks. The infantry, with their large shields and spears, were a critical component of the Crusader army, acting as a screen to protect the horsemen. Infantry archers also accompanied Baldwin's small force. It was sobering for the Crusaders when they caught sight of the sprawling Egyptian army. King Baldwin encouraged his men with a speech recorded by the chronicler Fulcare of Chartres, who was at the king's side at the time. Battlefield speeches from medieval chroniclers generally rely more on literary device than actual quotations from the speaker. This one has always struck historians as different. Not only was the speech recorded by a man present for the battle, but Baldwin's words are rather straightforward and convincing. Come then, soldiers of Christ, be of good cheer and fear nothing. Conduct yourselves manfully and you shall be mighty in this battle. Fight for the salvation of your souls. If you should be slain here, you will surely be among the blessed. If you survive as victors, you will shine in glory among all Christians. If, however, you wish to flee, remember that France is indeed a long distance away. Fulcare's record of Baldwin's words seems like the rather plain and soldierly encouragement from a king to his men. Die in the cause, you'll see heaven. If you win, you'll be a hero. If you're thinking of running, where will you run to? The speech matches with the rather stark, legalistic mind of Baldwin of Bologna, the man whose determination forged the Kingdom of Jerusalem into a major regional power. At the Battle of Ashkelon, the charge of the Franks had pulverized the Fatiman ranks almost at once. Here, Baldwin hoped to do the same. Fatiman archers loosed showers of arrows at the Crusaders, hoping to delay or slow their charge. But as at Ashkelon, Fatiman archery did little to inhibit the Crusaders, whose mail and shields offered excellent protection. Immediately, the first division of Frankish cavalry, led by a knight named Bervold, gave charge, attacking the center of the Fatiman army. The Fatimids suffered serious casualties in this first strike, but the density of their ranks absorbed it. The sheer numbers of the Fatiman infantry meant that the small line of Crusader knights was quickly in danger of being surrounded. Fulcare wrote down what he saw. Our men, although very few, dashed into the surging cohorts of the enemy like fowlers into a mass of birds, shouting, God help us! The number of the foe was so great, and they swarmed over us so quickly, that hardly anyone could see or recognize anyone else. Quickly, Bervold's knights were overwhelmed. Bervold himself fell during that initial attack, as did the bulk of his men. Only a few escaped, including one knight who lost a hand. After this dismal start, the 2nd Frankish Cavalry Division didn't hesitate. Led by Geldemar Carpenel, one of the late Duke Godfrey's right-hand men, they charged the Fatimids. Again, the initial impact killed plenty of Egyptian infantrymen, but the knights were overwhelmed. Geldemar fell in the fight. Only two of his knights, identified as William and Ergengold by the chronicler Albert of Aachen, made it back to rejoin the Frankish lines. At the Battle of Ascalon during the First Crusade, the Crusaders had had 11,000 men, including around 1,200 knights. Here, they had around 1,200 men in total, around 900 foot soldiers, and roughly 250 knights. The reduced size of the cavalry contingents was proving to be a major problem. Still, a third division prepared to attack, the Galilean knights, led by Hugh of Tiberius. Once more, they launched a charge. This time, the Christian knights did quite a bit more damage, and though they too suffered heavy losses, Hugh and a fair number of his comrades made it out and returned to the Crusader lines. At this point, the advantage was with the Fatimids. Unlike the Crusaders, they could absorb their losses and were even now regrouping. During this early phase, one contingent of Fatiman horses, Fulcare says they numbered 500, managed to deploy behind the Frankish army, where they inflicted some of the only significant casualties suffered by Baldwin's infantry during the battle. 
However, this Fatiman contingent failed to break through the Crusader ranks. Nevertheless, they thought the battle already won for their side, and so rode on north toward Jaffa, eager to plunder the villages while their comrades finished off Baldwin's little army. Baldwin had a choice to make. Try to withdraw his army and retreat back to Jaffa, or risk yet another charge. Baldwin chose the second option. The king himself would lead the fourth attack. At the center of his army stood the True Cross, the kingdom's most prized relic, held by the Bishop Gerard. Albert of Aachen tells us that Baldwin dismounted and fell forwards to the ground before the Lord's Cross and worshipped the God of Heaven. Then the king once more mounted his horse, lowered his lance, and took his place at the center of his knights. This would be an all-or-nothing charge. Again, full care of Charter was there, praying at the king's side. He witnessed the final charge and wrote down what he remembered. The king rode up at full speed with his own squadron and vigorously opposed the attack of the enemy, brandishing his lance from which flew a white banner. In the face of their superior might, he ran through a Saracen opposite him. The flag remained in the Saracen's belly when he was knocked to the ground from his horse. Baldwin pulled out his lance as I, standing near, witnessed, and he at once carried it, ready to slay others. Fulcare's account is quite gritty and vivid. We can see the priest standing there behind the protective screen of Crusader infantry, watching as the king and his knights charged out into the fray. This final charge broke the Egyptian center entirely, panicking the two Fatimid flanks. The Muslim chronicler Ibn al Khanisi tells us that the Fatimid general, Said al Dawla, died in the fighting. The Franks charged against him. And he strove to maintain his ground, but his predestined fate outstripped him, for his horse stumbled with him and he fell from it to the ground, and gained the prize of martyrdom on the spot, Allah's mercy upon him. As the Egyptians fled, the Crusaders pursued them to some extent, but their own small army was so badly depleted that their ability to harass the defeated was limited. The mounted Frankish sergeants and light eastern cavalry managed to harass some of the refugees as far as Ashkelon itself, while the infantry, who'd spent most of the battle in a defensive formation protecting the king's army, now had a chance to chase and kill the wounded and the exhausted stragglers trying to escape on foot. The victory of the Crusaders at the First Battle of Ramla in 1101 was not only striking and unlikely, it was crucial. If Baldwin had died and his army been destroyed in that final attack, what would have stopped the Fatimids from reclaiming Jerusalem? For the Fatimids, it was a terrible disappointment. Even now, faced with a much reduced Frankish army, they'd lost. But the victory hadn't come easy for Baldwin and his men. The price was a fair number of much-needed knights. The kingdom was saved, but just barely. If it were to survive, its military strength would have to be increased. Fulcair recalls the frightful nature of the battle he witnessed. I saw the battle. I wavered in my mind. I feared to be struck. All rushed to arms as if they did not fear death. There is dire calamity where love is lacking. The din arising from mutual exchange of blows was excessive. The battle had an epilogue. Remember, during the early stages of the fighting, the Franks suffered such serious losses that a contingent of Fatimid horsemen assumed their side had already won and so galloped north to pillage the lands around Jaffa. The appearance of this Fatimid contingent spread panic through the Christian villages. Many assumed Baldwin and his men had been destroyed, and the king's Armenian queen even prepared to flee. However, when Baldwin and his victorious army marched back toward Jaffa, they ran right into this band of merry Fatimid plunderers loaded with spoil and on their way back toward Egypt. Needless to say, their mood soon changed. 
Baldwin and his knights at once charged the Fatimids, destroying them. Only a handful managed to escape with their lives. Immediately, Baldwin sent word throughout the kingdom that he was alive and the Crusaders had conquered their enemies. Meanwhile, in the Principality of Antioch, Tancred showed himself a capable steward of his uncle's state. He reconquered Tarsus, Adana, and Mamistra, which had been reoccupied by the Greeks after Bohemond's capture. He conquered the strong fortress of Apamea from the Turks, and in 1102 he besieged and conquered the important port of Latakia. Bowman was in constant touch with his principality during his captivity, and even appointed Bernard of Valence as Latin Patriarch of Antioch. Bernard's reign would be long, and he would prove to be a wise and prudent leader of the Antiochian Church, as well as an asset to the Crusader states in general. The start of 1102 saw the beginnings of the Fourth Crusader State in the Levant. Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, had been one of the most important leaders of the First Crusade, a powerful man who ruled some of the wealthiest lands in what is today France. Raymond had been the oldest of the leading figures of the First Crusade. His army had been one of the largest, and he'd been among those who achieved the conquest of Jerusalem itself in 1099. But since the First Crusade, he'd been away from the Holy Land, serving the Byzantine Emperor, Alexius Comnenus. Raymond and Alexius would remain close allies. In late 1101 or early 1102, with the blessing of the Emperor, Raymond returned to the Levantine Theater, accompanied by around 300 knights. Raymond's target was well chosen. The magnificent coastal city of Tripoli, located between the spheres of influence of the Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, Tripoli was the ideal capital for a new Crusader state. But Tripoli itself was too large and powerful for Raymond to attack at once, with a mere 300 knights. First, he targeted the fortress of Tortosa, which he and his men captured with the help of a Genoese fleet on February 18, 1102. Tortosa was the base of operations Raymond needed to begin subduing Tripoli itself. The Emir of Tripoli was alarmed by these developments. He sent word to the Emir of Homs and to the powerful Seljuk Turkish ruler of Damascus, Dukak, asking for troops to help defend Tripoli. The struggle for Tripoli had only just begun and would prove to be a long war. Meanwhile, in Cairo, Al-Afdal, the Fatimid vizier of Egypt, was disappointed by the failure of his previous year's campaign against the Kingdom of Jerusalem. But he understood the peril of Baldwin's situation. The First Battle of Ramla had been narrowly won by the Crusaders. The thing for Egypt to do was launch another campaign, and quickly, before Jerusalem had time to raise reinforcements. Egypt was enormously wealthy, and Al-Afdal had no difficulty organizing another large army. He began preparations for an 1102 campaign. In Jerusalem, King Baldwin I received disappointing news. Several Crusader contingents, the so-called Crusade of 1101, had been destroyed in Asia Minor by the Seljuk Turks. This crusade of 1101, made up of forces from Burgundy, Blois, Aquitaine, and the Holy Roman Empire, had coordinated poorly with one another, operating separately rather than as a cohesive army, and had been unable to overcome the Seljuks as the First Crusade had done in 1097. These reinforcements would have been most welcomed by the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Their destruction was a bitter pill for Baldwin to swallow. The king heard all about the perils faced by the Crusade of 1101 in Asia Minor when some of its leaders arrived at his court in early 1102. Among them was Duke William IX of Aquitaine, the grandfather of Eleanor of Aquitaine, and Stephen, Count of Blois, who'd been one of the leaders of the First Crusade, but had abandoned his allies during the dark days of the Siege of Antioch in 1098. Stephen's flight from the First Crusade proved to be an unbearable stain on his reputation. 
While the other leaders of the First Crusade had achieved legendary status across Christian Europe, Stephen was widely reviled for having cut and run. Stephen's Norman wife, the Countess Adela, a daughter of William the Conqueror, was so humiliated that she incessantly demanded her husband lead another expedition to the Holy Land. By joining the Crusade of 1101, Stephen had hoped to repair his honor. Now, he was finally at Jerusalem, with what remained of his small force, following his disastrous experience in Asia Minor. Baldwin celebrated Easter with Count Stephen and Duke William. William then safely sailed for home in April, but bad weather prevented Stephen's departure from Jaffa. Just then, news arrived that the Fatimid army was once again advancing on Ramla. Stephen, eager to prove his worth, offered his small following of knights to Baldwin's cause. Baldwin eagerly accepted. He needed all the help he could get. So began the course of events leading to what historians call the Second Battle of Ramla. al afdal was confident that the motley crusader kingdom could not withstand a second invasion. This time, he placed his own son, Sharaf al-Ma'ali, in command. The Fatiman army was roughly the same size as the one mustered the previous year, well equipped to subdue Jerusalem. In mid-May, it marched out of Ashkelon and advanced rapidly on Ramla. Baldwin had not expected the Fatimids to move so quickly. He was horrified when a desperate plea for help arrived at Jaffa from the Bishop of Ramla. Ramla was besieged, with the king's garrison only barely holding out in the tower. At the moment, the kingdom's army was in the process of assembling, but Baldwin wanted to advance at once and try to drive the Egyptians from Ramla. Stephen of Blois suggested they wait until the army could be fully mustered. But Baldwin was inclined to set off at once, hoping to save Ramla. Stephen's advice was rejected. With only a few hundred knights and no infantry, Baldwin advanced rapidly on Ramla. He heard that the Fatimid army hadn't fully arrived, and it was only an advanced force attacking Ramla. If this were true, perhaps the king and his cavalry could scatter the Egyptians and establish a workable defense while they awaited the rest of the king's troops. As it turned out, Baldwin had miscalculated. Even his chaplain and court chronicler, full care of Chartres, criticizes the king's decision. It was indeed very rash for the king to neglect to wait for his men. He should have known better. Without foot soldiers and hardly waiting for his knights, he hurried to meet the enemy. It may surprise modern readers to find a king's servant so openly critical of him, but free speech tended to prevail among the Franks, and it was not uncommon for the king's men to voice their criticisms. To be fair, there was a certain logic to Baldwin's urgency. He knew that Fatiman armies were vulnerable to a determined, quick attack. Perhaps, if Baldwin could get at the Fatimans before they were fully organized and hit them hard, he could end their invasion quickly with minimal losses. But Baldwin suddenly found himself faced with the full might of the Fatiman army. It was too late to escape. The Fatimans were exhilarated to find themselves faced with the king and only a small number of knights. At once, their light cavalry maneuvered to cut off retreat. Baldwin, Stephen, and their fellow Franks, faced with this enormous foe, had one option, attack. Fulcare records, Indeed, this was the place and the occasion to show valor. The Franks hastily plunged among the Arabs in a brave assault, and because our knights numbered no more than two hundred, they were surrounded. Albert of Aachen, whose writing was primarily derived from interviewing survivors, vividly describes the interesting weapons used by the Sudanese infantry, which were quite effective against the outnumbered, surrounded Frankish knights. They attacked the king and his men with cudgels, made in the manner of hammers from iron and lead, and they hit not only the knights, 
but also their horses hard on the forehead and their other limbs, driving them away from the battle by their severe blows. Many knights fell in this combat. Baldwin and some of his knights, Fulcare says a few, Albert says fifty, made it out of the fray and managed to enter the Tower of Rama. Here, they were surrounded and trapped by the Fatimids who put the little fortress to siege. In this difficult situation, a Muslim nobleman whose family had been shown mercy by Baldwin during a previous raid helped smuggle the king out of Ramla along with a single squire and a knight called Hugh of Brulis. The next day, the Fatimids set the tower of Ramla aflame. Rather than perish in the fire, Stephen of Blois and the other knights still holding out in the fortress mounted their horses and made a desperate fierce charge out into the besieging enemy. They went down fighting, but took a fair number of Egyptian troops with them. At last, Stephen of Blois had his heroic end, and in fact, his reputation was widely restored throughout Christendom. Meanwhile, Baldwin and his two companions fled like thieves into the wilderness. They barely escaped from the area without being noticed by the triumphant Fatimid army. The Second Battle of Ramla had ended in a clear victory for the Egyptians. They intended now to capitalize on it and prepared to advance on Jaffa and Jerusalem. Word of the Fatimid victory spread panic through the kingdom of Jerusalem. Fatimid raiders fanned out with impunity across the kingdom, harassing the towns and castles and burning villages. Albert writes, This cruel news spread to Jerusalem and struck great fear into all who lived there. The entire city was plunged into grief and lamentation. Many were convinced Baldwin himself was dead. There was even talk of abandoning Jerusalem until a knight named Gutman, a survivor of the Battle of Ramla, appeared, insisting that Baldwin was still alive. He convinced the Crusaders to hold out until they were certain the king was dead. The Crusaders held the walls, fighting off Fatimid raiders. But Baldwin was not dead. The king, scouring through the countryside, made it back to his own territory. He appeared at Arsuf, where he was greeted joyously by the garrison. At around the same time, the Lord of Galilee, Hugh of St. Omer, arrived with his eighty knights. When Baldwin learned that the Fatimid army was advancing on Jaffa, he at once summoned together the forces at his disposal, including Hugh and his knights, survivors from Ramla, as well as an assortment of infantry and pilgrim troops. Then, the king boarded a ship and set out for Jaffa. Meanwhile, the queen and the court held out at Jaffa. Roger of Rezoi and other surviving knights from Ramla arrived, reporting that all was surely lost, Baldwin most likely dead. The queen and Roger began to make plans to flee, to board ships and depart Jaffa for the west. However, on May 20, before they could make their escape, the Fatimid army arrived in force before the city, while the Fatimid fleet appeared on the southern horizon. Roger and the others were trapped within Jaffa. The Fatimids demanded the surrender of Jaffa. They brought out a bloody torso clad in a purple cloak with the head and legs cut off, claiming that this was the body of the king. This deeply distressed the crusaders watching from the walls. Roger and the Queen were on the verge of surrendering when a ship appeared from the direction of Arsuf, flying the King's standard. It was Baldwin. The King was alive. Hope was restored. While Baldwin approached Jaffa by sea, Hugh of St. Omer drove toward Jaffa by land with his cavalry. The Egyptian fleet tried to intercept Baldwin's ship, but the English sailors piloting the king's vessel avoided the Fatimid attack and brought the king safely into Jaffa's harbor. Once inside, Baldwin mounted a horse, gathered what knights he could, and made a sortie from the town and battled his way through the Fatimid lines, allowing Hugh and his knights to join him within Jaffa. 
By now, the Fatimids were getting a little nervous, but the king was still horribly outnumbered, and the general, Sharaf al-Ma'ali, was confident he could eventually starve the crusaders out. Then, unexpected reinforcements arrived to bolster Baldwin's army. A large pilgrim fleet appeared on the sea, filled with soldiers from England, France, and Germany. The pilgrim fleet was large enough to break the Egyptian blockade. The king and his companions felt certain that God had saved them as they watched hundreds of fresh troops disembarking onto Jaffa's port. Baldwin now had a substantial army under his command. On May 27, he emerged with his forces from Jaffa and attacked the Fatimid besiegers. The Fatimids tried to encircle Baldwin, but the king and a picked force of knights launched a cavalry charge that quickly shattered the Fatimid center. Once again, a well-timed cavalry attack. Once again, a decisive moment. This caused panic throughout the Fatimid ranks. Units began to desert, and soon the whole of the Fatimid army was in a total rout toward Ashkelon. Baldwin and his fresh forces pursued them at will, cutting down those that they could and gathering up all of the booty left behind in the Egyptian camp. The Fatimids had won the 1102 Battle of Ramla, but they had lost the 1102 Battle of Jaffa. The Crusaders had turned defeat into victory. For the second year in a row, the Fatimid invasion had been thwarted. The history of the Fatimid invasion of 1102 is truly remarkable. If the events of 1101 had been perilous for the Crusaders, 1102 had been very nearly a total disaster. It's easy to see why the Latin Christians of the Kingdom of Jerusalem felt that God alone could explain their ultimate victory in 1102. At several points, total catastrophe had been averted by the most unlikely of good fortunes. But, in naturalistic terms, the determination and scrappy toughness of the Crusaders did perhaps give them an edge against the somewhat unwieldy bureaucratic Fatimid Bayamoth. Whatever the case, the kingdom was again saved, once again narrowly. It's noteworthy to consider the king's own mistakes during the course of these events. His own chronicler criticizes his hastiness in advancing too quickly before the Battle of Ramla but there is strong evidence he learned from these events, as we'll see. Baldwin I was a bold leader. This was part of what made him successful, but the vice associated with boldness, of course, is rashness. Sometimes the daring, quick decision-making of successful crusading pioneers could lead to costly defeats. The record of King Baldwin I's reign is, for the most part, one of a competent, capable king. Even during the events of 1102, he showed courage and decisiveness that helped result ultimately in victory. But some of his initial mistakes had devastating results that could have been avoided. Many lives were lost, including, from the kingdom's perspective, many valuable knights. Fatimid raiding parties had devastated the countryside before the king finally managed to pull off a victory at Jaffa. As ever, history is a record of flawed men. For the Fatimids, the events of 1102 were all the more demoralizing. This time they'd even achieved an initial battlefield victory, only to lose it all before Jaffa. Many Fatimid officers criticized Sharaf al-Ma'ali as incompetent, and al-Afdal's control of the Fatimid state suffered due to the two years of consecutive failures. It would be several years before the Fatimids would again seriously threaten the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Now that we have looked at the intense events in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the year of 1102 and the beginnings of the County of Tripoli, let's turn to the northernmost Crusader states, the Principality of Antioch and the County of Edessa. As we'll recall, the County of Edessa had been left under the care of King Baldwin I's cousin, Baldwin of Bork, who ruled Edessa as Count Baldwin II. Count Baldwin's situation was difficult. 
The county of Odessa had no natural frontiers and was exposed to attack from the powerful Turkish rulers operating on its northern, eastern, and southern frontiers, especially the Ortakid Turks of Mardin. The count needed strong garrisons to protect his castles, and he relied heavily on local Armenian Christians who made up the bulk of Odessa's population. To solidify his alliances, Baldwin II married Morphia, daughter of a great Armenian nobleman, Gabriel of Melitene. Remember, it was Gabriel who Bowman had tried to help back in 1100. The Armenians and Franks forged a close bond that endured throughout the Crusades era. But the Armenians couldn't get used to the shaven faces of many Frankish knights who brought that fashion with them from the West. We hear of Baldwin's father-in-law, Gabriel, being shocked by the idea of his daughter's husband going around beardless. There is even a story that Gabriel paid Baldwin 30,000 besants not to shave his beard. This may just be an amusing tale told around firesides or among garrison troops as they pass the long, vigilant nights in Crusader castles. What this really tells us is that Gabriel was a generous contributor to the funds needed to defend the county of Edessa. In 1101 or 1102, one of Count Baldwin's cousins, Jocelyn of Courtenay, arrived at Edessa seeking employment. Jocelyn had fought in the ill-fated crusade of 1101 and was determined to make his way in the crusader states. Baldwin was delighted by his cousin's arrival and invested him with the important lordship of Turbacel, which included all of the castles on the western side of the Euphrates. Jocelyn would prove to be a key player in the success of the county of Edessa. Meanwhile, in the Principality of Antioch, Tancred appeared to be in no hurry to secure the release of his uncle Bohemond. Instead, it was Baldwin II of Edessa and Patriarch Bernard of Antioch negotiating with the Danish men Turks for Bohemond's release. Finally, an agreement was reached. The Count of Edessa and the Patriarch of Antioch, with the help of the wealthy Normans of southern Italy, raised 100,000 Byzants, and in early 1103, Bowman was released by the Danish Mens at Melitene. Bowman, who had a flair for the dramatic, made his hero's return to Antioch. Publicly, Tancred and Bowman greeted each other with great affection. But behind closed doors, the Norman giant castigated his nephew for lack of effort in securing his release. Still, Bowman was impressed by Tancred's achievements in his absence, as the principality had been expanded and secured. Tancred would remain Bowman's right-hand man. So, this was the situation of the Crusader states in the three years following the end of the First Crusade. From precarious beginnings, these small, remote outposts of Latin Christendom in the heart of Islam had survived and even shown considerable vigor in the face of great challenges. The key to their survival was the determination and capability of their founders. King Baldwin I, Tancred, and Count Baldwin II could be ruthless men, but they were also capable rulers and knew how to forge strong alliances. All men embraced the local Christians as allies and showed no interest in oppressing local Christian traditions. Armenian and other Christian rites were practiced in the Crusader states right alongside the Latin rite, and the rulers of the Crusader states wanted it this way. They needed the goodwill of the Eastern Christians who staffed garrisons and helped with local administration. Many Frankish knights married Eastern Christian women, and many sons of the Crusader states were of mixed Western and Eastern ethnicity. Clearly, the Crusader states were only possible because of cooperation between Western Franks and Eastern Armenians, Syrians, Jacobites, etc. King Baldwin and Tancred both knew how to maintain and strengthen the military establishments that protected their frontiers, and both were aggressive conquerors as well, always on the lookout for an opportunity to attack and subdue neighboring castles and cities. Both leaders relied heavily on the resources of the church. In Baldwin's case, he subdued and made use of the church establishment in Jerusalem. Tancred was fortunate that the Patriarch of Antioch, Bernard, was a practical man who tended to agree with the plans of Antioch's prince. It was the energy, organization, and commitment of the pioneering generation of the Crusader states that allowed them to endure. We should also consider the neighboring Muslim powers at this point. The Crusaders at this stage had several important and powerful enemies. 
The wealthy and well-structured Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt was the greatest threat to the Kingdom of Jerusalem at this phase, and clearly nearly wiped it out during these early years. The ability of the kingdom to survive and defeat the Fatimids was absolutely essential. Next, the Emirate of Damascus was a powerful Seljuk Turkish state to the east, and though it posed a great challenge at this phase, it was also occupied with its squabbles with, for example, rival Seljuk powers such as the Emirate of Aleppo. Aleppo was another formidable power center, but Tancred had shown himself capable of defeating the Seljuks of Aleppo so far. Finally, the Orticids of Mardin were a rising power and would soon prove to be a serious threat to Edessa. But again, Baldwin II was holding his own. Beyond this, it's important to recognize that the Crusader states were increasingly occupying a place in the power politics of the region. The Muslim powers were willing to negotiate and deal diplomatically with the Crusaders at times, even as they were willing to fight them. The Fatimids at this point were the power most determined to wipe out the Crusaders. The other Muslim powers, especially the Seljuks, often behaved as though they regarded the Crusaders as just one more competing power element in the region, though a sense of religious obligation to fight the Crusaders was also present and could be activated. Certainly the frontier fighting between the Ortikid and Seljuk Turks and the Crusaders of Antioch and Edessa was fierce, but how religious was it versus how much did it merely amount to competing warlords fighting it out? Surely the religious element played a role and could become decisive. But the fighting in the north of Syria after the Crusaders arrived wasn't terribly different from the tit-for-tat raiding and battling that went on among the Turks themselves and their rivals before the First Crusade. Saladin Yusuf ibn Ayyub, known to the world as Saladin, emerges from the pages of history as a figure of unparalleled complexity and greatness. Saladin's early years were shaped by the turbulent political landscape of the Islamic world during the 12th century. He was born in modern-day Iraq in around the year 1137. His given name was Yusuf, while Saladin served as a nickname he gained in adulthood an honorific title translating to the righteousness of the faith. Information about Saladin's childhood is scarce. Nevertheless, several sources claim that during his youth, he was very knowledgeable in the Quran and the sciences of religion. The loss of Jerusalem during the First Crusade became a powerful catalyst for Saladin's interest in religion. The desecration of sacred sites and the displacement of Muslim communities fueled a sense of injustice. Saladin, surrounded by the remnants of a once glorious Islamic civilization, would have felt a compelling need to understand, preserve, and revitalize the cultural and religious identity of his people. Saladin, in his youth, likely found inspiration in the stories of resilience and resistance exhibited by his forebears during the period of the Crusades. Saladin embarked on his military journey under the guidance of his paternal uncle, Shirka, a distinguished military commander serving under Nur ad-Din, the ruler of Aleppo and Damascus, who ruled the Syrian province of the Seljuk Empire. In the year 1067, Saladin would take part in the Battle of Al-Babian. He played a significant role, commanding the right wing of the army, while his uncle Shirka commanded the centre. Saladin would draw King Amalric of Jerusalem's troops away from the battlefield with a feigned retreat, transforming the battle into several smaller skirmishes. He would also capture Lord Hugh of Cassera and wipe out his unit, joining back up with the bulk of his army. This would end the battle, resulting in victory for Saladin and Nur ad-Din. Saladin would then make his way to Egypt, which at this point was in a state of decay. The political and social situation was in turmoil, with the Fatimid Caliphate losing their grip on power. The Fatimids traced their ancestry to the Islamic prophets Muhammad's daughter Fatima and her husband. The Fatimid dynasty ruled territories across the Mediterranean coast and ultimately made Egypt its centre. 
with the empire spanning a large area of North Africa and West Asia. However, by 1168, Nur ad-Din, the emir of the Zengid dynasty, and Saladin's uncle Shirka, had come to Egypt to relieve the Fatimids from a crusader invasion. Saladin's uncle would be appointed as the ruler of Egypt, but Shirka would die just two months later. The power vacuum created by Shirka's demise provided an opportunity for Saladin to consolidate authority in Egypt. However, Saladin was a foreigner in Egypt and faced many posing threats from the established Fatimid military and the elites. Nevertheless, by the time Saladin was appointed as the ruler of Egypt, the caliphate was a shadow of its former glory days, having been severely weakened by the Seljuk Turks and the Crusaders in the 11th century. Saladin's ascension to the role of vizier sidelined the caliph al-Adid, who was meant to be the ruler. This would lead to a conspiracy. Egyptian soldiers would attempt to assassinate Saladin. One of the lead conspirators was an African eunuch, who Saladin ordered to be killed. This triggered the Battle of the Slaves, a fight between the black African units of the Fatimid army and the Sunni Syrian troops loyal to Saladin. The clashes lasted for two days, but in the end, the African troops were annihilated. This would culminate in the restoration of Saladin's dominance over Egypt. Members of Saladin's family were installed as governors. The civilian bureaucracy was largely won over to the new regime, and the caliph al al did was said to be frail and soon died at the age of 20. Some reports say he was poisoned, and others that he simply died from being unwell, again creating a power vacuum. Saladin quickly overthrew the Fatimid dynasty and became the undisputed ruler of Egypt. After the fall of the Fatimid caliphate, Saladin initiated a transformative shift, converting the country's official faith from Shia to Sunni further dismantling the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. Simultaneously, Saladin undertook an ambitious recruitment campaign to assemble a new army loyal to himself, rather than the deceased Fatimid Caliph, who passed away in the year 1171. Saladin's superior Nur al-Din would die in the year 1174, his ten-year-old son succeeding him. Seizing the opportunity, Saladin, accompanied by his devoted army, journeyed from Egypt to Syria. There, he assumed control and declared himself the Sultan of the extensive territory. Subsequently, in 1177, Saladin ventured into Palestine following the breakdown of the truce with the Crusaders. His objective was to reclaim territories seized by the Crusaders and establish a formidable Muslim presence in Palestine. This marked a pivotal moment for Saladin's quest for territorial consolidation and his emergence as the formidable leader in the broader Islamic world. Saladin, now the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, had consolidated the Muslim world using a combination of military campaigns and strategic alliances. His ambition was to unify all Muslim territories under a single banner. To achieve this goal, he declared himself the champion of jihad a sacred struggle, aiming to protect Islam and expel the Christians from the Holy Land through a holy war. However, Saladin faced a threat from a sect known as the Assassins, a religious order of killers who did not agree with Saladin's rule or sect of Islam. The Assassins were fanatically loyal to their leader, Rashid ad-Din Sinan, also known as the Old Man of the Mountain. The headquarters of the assassins was Alamut Castle, which was famed for its beautiful heavenly gardens, which young assassin trainees would mistake for paradise. The order allegedly drugged teenage boys with hashish, causing them to fall asleep. When they woke, they found themselves in the gardens of Alamut Castle, surrounded by beautiful women. The young men thought they had arrived in heaven, but were soon re-drugged and woke back up in a different section of the castle. Paradise was then offered to the boys if they trained to become assassins and followed the old man of the mountain's orders. Saladin had evaded assassination from the order twice. He set out to vanquish them. He laid siege to Masyaf Castle in the year 1176, 
one of the assassins' territories. But one night of the siege, something happened that made Saladin rethink his war. One night, Saladin's guards noticed a spark glowing down the hill near the castle, and then vanishing near the tents. Saladin awoke from his sleep to find a shadowy figure leaving his tent. He saw that the lamps in his tent were displaced, and beside his bed was a note, at the top pinned by a poisoned dagger. The note threatened that he would be killed if he did not withdraw from the siege. Saladin, realising that his life had just been spared, sought to abandon the attack and align himself with the assassins, thinking they would be a valuable ally, and feared what would happen if they befriended the crusaders. Sinan and Saladin thereafter became allies. Through fate, Saladin cheated death and gained the allegiance of one of the most powerful assassin orders of the age. Saladin would soon turn his attention to Jerusalem. He heard the tales when the crusaders took the city. They butchered all within. In the year 1174, Baldwin IV would ascend to the throne, some 75 years after the First Crusade's seizure of Jerusalem. Baldwin, however, had leprosy. This debilitating illness would greatly take a toll on him, but Baldwin was primarily a knight and would defend Jerusalem from Saladin. Saladin would devise a plan for his invasion. Upon learning of Saladin's intentions, Baldwin departed Jerusalem with a mere 375 knights, aiming to defend Ascalon. Yet, Baldwin's efforts were hindered as he confronted a contingent of troops dispatched by Saladin. Confident that Baldwin wouldn't dare pursue him with such a limited force, Saladin would advance towards Jerusalem, pillaging several cities under the assumption that Baldwin posed no threat. Unbeknownst to Saladin, the forces left to subdue the king were insufficient. Led by King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem, the Christians pursued the Muslims along the coast, ultimately cornering their adversaries. This culmination led to the Battle of Montgizard in the year 1177. With Baldwin's teenage body ravaged by aggressive leprosy, he ordered the relic of the True Cross to be raised before his troops, dropping to his knees and praying for victory. He then rose and faced cheers from his men, who were deeply moved by the spectacle. The leper king would fight among his men, his hands bandaged to conceal his sores. This act alone conveys what a chivalrous warrior Baldwin truly was. The Christian forces would quickly overcome the Muslims. Baldwin relentlessly pursued Saladin until nightfall, with Saladin's personal bodyguard being slain. He narrowly avoided capture by fleeing on a swift camel, albeit with most of his men meeting their demise. This triumph elevated the teenage leper king to legendary status, decisively defeating Saladin in a remarkable battle. Saladin narrowly escaped death. This would not discourage him, however, on his holy quest of taking Jerusalem. Saladin would soon defeat Baldwin in the Battle of Marjayun. The Grand Master of the Templar Order was captured, and King Baldwin barely escaped, unable to mount a horse because of his crippling disease. He was carried to safety by a knight, as his bodyguard cut a bloody path through the Saracens. This battle revealed how King Baldwin's physical condition was quickly deteriorating. He could no longer command his armies from horseback. In the year 1180, Saladin arranged a truce between himself and two Christian leaders, King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem and Raymond III of Tripoli, to prevent bloodshed. But two years later, in the year 1182, Lord Renald of Châtillon ruthlessly attacked Muslim caravans passing through his lands on the way for pilgrimage, breaking pacts for safe passage of pilgrims. Resenting this violation of the truce, Saladin immediately assembled his army and prepared to strike. In the year 1183, Saladin laid siege to the castle of Kerak, a crusader stronghold. At this point, Baldwin was dying. In the year 1184, he developed a fever and would pass away. In his final moments, he made his nephew Baldwin V king and installed Raymond of Tripoli as regent. 
Tragically, the following year, the young Baldwin also passed away. Sibylla, the late Baldwin IV's sister, who ascended to the throne after her son, appointed her husband Guy as the king of Jerusalem. By the year 1187, the leader of the Crusader army was Guy of Louisiana. However, Guy's suitability to lead the army into battle was questionable due to several shortcomings. He lacked military expertise, portraying characteristics of a weak and indecisive leader. Moreover, his claim to the crown was not universally accepted, as he ascended to kingship through a palace coup. On the other hand, Saladin, the renowned Muslim military leader and Sultan of Egypt and Syria, confronted the Crusader forces led by Guy. The circumstances leading up to the battle were marked by internal divisions among the Crusaders and the strategic brilliance of Saladin. Saladin was still enraged that Renald de Chatillon had attacked innocent Muslim pilgrims and swore to slay him personally, motivating him to invade the Crusader kingdoms in the year 1187. Saladin found himself in the decisive confrontation with the combined might of the Crusader forces led by Guy of Louisiana, the King Consort of Jerusalem. This clash of arms took place at the Battle of Hattin that would etch its place in history. Saladin, displaying remarkable military acumen, faced off against a Crusader force that, unfortunately for them, proved to be ill-fated from the outset. The heat took its toll on the Crusaders in their armour, and they exhausted the small amount of water that they had. The engagement at Hattin witnessed the near total annihilation of the Crusader force, marking a profound disaster for their aspirations in the Holy Land. The repercussions of this crushing defeat resonated far beyond the battlefield, ushering in a new chapter in the history of the Crusades. Amidst the chaos of the battle, Saladin achieved a significant victory, capturing Renald of Châtillon. Saladin would personally behead him, but allowed Guy to eventually be ransomed. Saladin had just solidified his reputation as a formidable military leader, but also reshaped the geographical landscape of the Holy Land, as Jerusalem had now fallen to the Muslims. The fall of Jerusalem, however, would set the stage for the Third Crusade led by Richard I of England, otherwise known as Richard the Lionheart. The clash between Saladin and Richard the Lionheart during the late 12th century epitomises one of the most renowned confrontations in the annals of the Crusades. Saladin, a skilled military strategist and statesman, rose to prominence as a unifier. His reputation for chivalry and honour, coupled with his military prowess, distinguished him as a leader of unparalleled stature. On the opposing side, Richard the Lionheart, known for his martial prowess and indomitable spirit, emerged as the central figure in the Third Crusade. The Third Crusade, spanning from the years 1189 to 1192, saw the collision of Saladin and Richard on the stage of the Holy Land. One of the notable battles in this historic rivalry was the Battle of Asaf in the year 1191. Richard the Lionheart, leading the Crusader forces, demonstrated his military brilliance by securing a decisive victory over Saladin's army. The clash highlighted Richard's tactical acumen and the resilience of the Crusader forces. However, Saladin's ability to retreat strategically without suffering a complete defeat showcased his adaptability on the battlefield. Beyond the military engagements, the interactions between Saladin and Richard revealed a complex interplay of diplomacy and mutual respect. The two leaders engaged in negotiations, displaying a certain level of chivalry and honour that transcended the brutality of medieval warfare. Despite being adversaries, Saladin and Richard developed mutual admiration, recognising the qualities of valour and honour in each other. The culmination of their interactions occurred with the signing of the Treaty of Jaffa in the year 1192, effectively bringing an end to the military hostilities of the Third Crusade. Saladin even said that there was not a more honourable Christian lord than Richard. The treaty 
allowed for Christian pilgrims to access Jerusalem peacefully, marking a pragmatic resolution to the conflict. Saladin died of a fever in the year 1193, at the age of 56. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe and share, and I'll see you all soon.